Okay, good evening once again, all the participants. I think everyone have taken a very good health break, I had a coffee break, and uh, now everyone is excited for the last session of this wonderful five days Crit Summer School, which was organized by Taylor's University Malaysia. So we are going for the last session, session eleven, which is tourism and peace. For that, we have three speakers from three different countries, Dr. Anna from Cyprus and Dr. Fabio from UK, Dr. Omo from Kuwait joining us virtually. And the session will be moderated by Dr. Ellis and Ms. Karia from the Taylor's University, Malaysia. So without further ado, let me go to the next slide with a soft reminder again. Uh, yeah, please keep your Omeros cameras open during the digital photo session and we have been muted the mic for the participants to have a smooth flow of sharing session by all of the three speakers. So once again, lastly, please kindly post your questions only in the Slido. The code will be shared in the next slide. Question posted in the Zoom will not be entertained. Please use Zoom chat for any technical inquiries or probably sharing your contact for networking. Please use your full name by renaming yourself. We have given the permission because we will use your name for the attendance as well as for the certification of this respective session. A pool will be released in Zoom as like previous sessions at the beginning of the interactive Q&A and the results will be shared after the summary by the moderator. So here you go, take your smartphones to scan this QR code and our team will be also posting the link in the chat. Okay, the same code we will also will be using at the end for the feedback too. Okay, without further ado, let me quickly introduce uh, the moderator for this great session level, Tourism and Peace, right? Okay. Uh, we have Dr. Ellis, uh, who is a program director for the postgraduates from the School of Food Studies and Gastronomy. Uh, Dr. Ellis hailed from France, but she has been in Taylor's with Taylor's for almost a decade. And uh, she is an anthropologist as well as a food sociologist. And she has done a number of research publications and handling a lot of research projects. One of the great things is her food barometer project in the Asian context and uh, probably in the without further ado let me in request Dr. Ellis the, from the Taylor's University of Malaysia to take over this virtual floor Dr. Ellis. Thank you very much Dr. Kanapan. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome uh, all of you here in this uh, last session Tourism and Peace. As we are aware, the United Nations was created in uh, 1945 uh, during the Second World War then, uh, with a very central uh, mission, the maintenance of international peace and security. It is just not a surprise that peace is embedded in the Sustainable de Development Goals, and more specifically in the Goal 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institution, uh, which look into the promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies for uh, sustainable development. Then we can ask, okay, how can uh, tourism contribute to peace? This is a question which is very, very central in uh, academia. Uh, myself, uh, besides uh, uh, the question of the food barometer, I'm involved in uh, uh, some projects looking into how actually we can leverage on uh, food heritage uh, to uh, promote actually uh, to be promoted by, tour uh, by uh, tourism, sorry, yes. Uh, and I believe that uh, we will have uh, here the opportunity uh, to debate uh, really like this question with the three speakers uh, for this last session. Um, very uh, um, generally speaking here, uh, we'll go through first an introduction with Dr. Anna, uh, more on the theoretical uh, tenets of this discussion. Uh, we'll follow suit then with Dr. Fabio, uh, will um, here give us uh, some overview of uh, different um, cases and will uh, open uh, with critical uh, thoughts uh, with Dr. Ma. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, briefly Dr. Anna Famaki uh, to you all. 
Uh, so Dr. Anna Famaki is assistant professor in tourism management at the Cyprus University of Technology. Her research interests uh, lie primarily in uh, tourism uh, planning and development uh, with emphasis on sustainable tourism and tourism behavior. Today, she will contribute to bridge the gap between tourism and peace. Uh, her contribution here will uh, be more, uh, as mentioned here, with an overview on the theoretical background uh, to question uh, how actually uh, tourism, uh, or even the argument, I would say, uh, of actually uh, peace uh, taught uh, tourism uh, here. She will uh, then actually uh, emphasize on the need of uh, holistic examination of tourism and peace uh, nexus that considers the conditions uh, pertaining uh, to the nature and causes of conflict, because peace uh, is always coming with conflict too, or contempla uh, contemplating conflict, and the multifaced and complex system of actors, sectors, and dimension that make up tourism. Dr. Anna, the screen is yours for 25 minutes. Thank you, Alice, for the introduction. So um, I think I need to share my screen. Uh, one minute. Can you see now? Okay, good. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, there is a lot to cover in this presentation that provides an overview of uh, the theories that are relevant um, in terms of the interface of tourism and peace. So let's start. Uh, for some reason, I cannot move to the next slide. Oh, okay. Um, so as we all know, human history has been plagued by conflict and uh, wars and this brings devastating effects on uh, countries' political uh, systems, economy, social systems, on the behavior of societal members. In the 20th century alone, it is estimated that 108 million people died from war-related causes and more than 70 million were forcibly displaced as a result of conflict. What we see uh, after World War II is that there is a decrease in inter- um, State conflict, but there is an, um, an increase in intrastate conflict, especially civil war, uh, conflict in certain parts of the world, such as the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. So this indicates that there is uh, an overall decline in global peacefulness. So within this context, uh, policymakers have highlighted the importance of peace and recently included peace as a sustainable development goal in the United Nations Agenda 2030. Uh, peace includes, uh, represents Sustainable develop, Development Goal 16, and according to the UN, uh, the aim is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Now, uh, what is the relevance of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, Tourism and Peace? Um, Tourism, of course, has been acknowledged as a significant industry that can promote sustainable development across the world. And even though it has not been identified as a specific target for the achievement of um, the goal on peace, the World Tourism Organization acknowledges that tourism can potentially contribute to reconciliation and peace building. Indeed, tourism can address several challenges that are relevant to um, inequalities and peace, such as poverty, inequalities at the economic level or social level, climate change, environment degradation, and of course, justice and peace. Now, the so-called peace or tourism tenant, as it is called, um, in a way began in the, 19, uh, in the late 1980s when Luis Zamora invited researchers to consider the role of tourism in peace building. Um, he then uh, went on to uh, establish the International Institute of Tourism through Peace. So since there has been a lot of interest on the interface between tourism and peace, uh, initially conceptual and perceptual studies emerged that uh, advocated the role of tourism um, as an agent of um, peace, as a potential tool uh, for bringing uh, reconciliation and building peace. These studies um, tended to focus on visitors' perceptions before the trip and after the trip, when they 
the, the trip when they visited a hostile community. Then subsequent studies were performed that draw from various different contexts, adopting various perspectives, looking at specific tourist forms. So there is a plethora of valuable and interesting uh, studies investigating the relationship between tourism and peace. Most of these studies, if not all, fo uh, um, focused and were based on the contact hypothesis. So the rationale is that tourism can bring peace uh, between divided communities or communities that are hostile with one another because uh, travel brings people together. So a rapport is established, understanding is gained by uh, people of opposing communities um, because there is some kind of interaction. Tourism was also um, acknowledged as potentially building confidence uh, between nations and encouraging cooperation. So tourism cooperation can uh, enhance contact between opposing groups and improve human relations um, by alleviating negative stereotypes. Now, the advocates of peace through tourism, I would personally say that there is a school of thought that supports the peace through tourism tenet, and then, of course, there is the other side, the critical uh, side. The advocates uh, suggest that tourism is presented um, in specific studies as a force for peace. It is recognized as a track to diplomacy that can contribute to peace among nations because of travel-induced contact, being able to bring understanding, interaction among people, and so on. In fact, an interesting term arose to uh, describe the role of um, uh, tourism in normalizing relations between uh, nations and renewing a destination after conflict and war, and that was Phoenix Tourism by Kosevich and uh, Lynch. Now, the other side, the critical side, suggests that tourism um, is not uh, on its own capable of improving the understanding between host uh, communities and bringing peace because of the, of the presence of several factors. So if we look at an all of, um, if we look at pertinent studies looking at tourism uh, contribution to peace, we can see that there are certain factors acknowledged as barriers to this contribution, such as nationalistic sentiments being very prevalent, distrust and pre prejudice, political tensions between nations, minimal government support for reconciliation in peace building and competition over economic resources. So these are just some of the factors that have been acknowledged as potentially inhibiting the potential of um, uh, peace through tourism. So a question that has been uh, put forth as a, as a debate, is tourism a beneficiary of peace or a cause of peace? Now, um, the critics suggest that uh, the increase in travel after World War II indicates that tourism actually benefits from stability and peace rather than the other way around. Uh, Rowan suggested that much of tourism scholarship is pervaded by unsubstantiated normative assumptions that tourism can lead to peace, that it is a romantic view that ignores certain characteristics of tourism as, a, as a, an industry, as a global industry, and so on. So uh, the critics suggest that tourism cannot flourish in the midst of conflict, yes, but at the same time, people have always traveled, but traveling didn't minimize the propensity of nations to enter into conflict or to eliminate gaps between um, opposing communities. So um, based on this debate, I um, published a paper in 2017 in Tourism Management uh, where I called for a critical evalu evaluation of the peace to tourism tenet that should center not just on the question of whether tourism contributes to peace, but what tourism may bring to peace. Um, so I proposed certain questions that need to be considered, such as what type of tourism um, or tourist forms are appropriate for peace building. What forms of peace um, can tourism contribute to? So a lot of the studies tend to view peace as a general term, but as we will see later on in this presentation, that's not the case. And what I also emphasized was the need to consider the conditions of conflict. Uh, a lot of the um, extant literature on peace through tourism draws from specific 
conflict settings. Every setting is in a way unique. There are certain conditions, certain characteristics uh, relevant to a conflict situation in a specific destination that need to be taken into consideration because um, a successful project in one country may not necessarily lead to um, the same result in another setting. So I emphasize the need to consider these characteristics of conflict when we are talking about uh, tourism and peace. So um, in my view, it's important when we talk about tourism and peace, to also add the other important component in this discussion, which is conflict, uh, the antipode of, of uh, peace. So generally, conflict is defined as a struggle over values and claims um, to scrums status, power, and resources in which the aims of the opponent are to neutralize, injure, or eliminate rivals. So there are four conditions, um, in a way, required in, in, for a conflict to erupt. First of all, we need two or more parties. We need a situation where resource scarcity exists, where uh, interests are contrary, and there needs to be a behavior aiming at harming opponents. So the key characteristics of conflict as recognized by political science theory is that conflict may involve overt, but also coercive um, behavior with parties acting upon their conflicting interests. So the word acting is important because um, it's not uh, a precondition that conflict means war. You can have a more a less active form of conflict present in a, in a country, which is important for the peace to tourism tenant because, um, as we will see later on, peace is not just the absence of, of war or of, of active conflict. So it's important to understand that conflict can be violent, but they can also be not uh, violent. Uh, what is generally accepted is, is that conflicts go through phases, so uh, they can go from a passive to an active dynamic phase, demonstrating escalation and de-escalation um, phases. Now, the key causes of conflict can be uh, categorized according to two theories. Agency theories suggest that conflict um, lie in, into the perceptions at the individual and collective agency level. Some scholars uh, propose that conflicts emerge at the micro level due to the psychological need of individuals to differentiate. So, agency theories look at differences, intergroup differences that are present. Structural theories suggest that conflicts may emerge at the macro level uh, due to economic factors, political factors, um, highlighting the influence of political institutional factors and resource based competition. Now, there is a problem with this um, structural and agency um, theories. Both theories are inadequate on their own to explain why conflicts are caused. Agency theories, on the one hand, fail to consider the wider political, economic, and social processes that take place, and structural theories fail to consider why multi ethnic societies have no intergroup conflict or why homogeneous societal groups often clash. So uh, in recent years, there is a shift in paradigm with scholars suggesting a meso approach, synthesizing the micro level and the macro level, consider considering um, micro level conflict dynamics within a wider political, economic and social process. This is a list of the key theories uh, that uh, can be identified in political science theory, uh, divided by um, the level, micro, macro level, and meso um, theories. So a summary of conflict th theory suggests that conflict may erupt from um, as a result of ethnic uh, divisions, as a result of economic factors and resource competition, and or political and institutional factors. So while interstate conflict is largely motivated by economic and resource competition um, factors, the majority of civil conflict represents ethnic conflict. So ethnicity is um, an important element uh, for um, intergroup conflict. And as I said in the beginning of this presentation, there is an increase in recent years in um, civil conflict, uh, which is important, of course, because this uh, draws attention on uh, groups of people which are um, 
are called to come into interaction when traveling. Uh, now, conflicts need to be mobilized uh, into um, violence, which is an important aspect. So conflicts require a mobilization strategy on behalf of political actors. So the fact that there is tension between certain groups uh, of a society doesn't necessarily mean that there is um, an active conflict. So this needs to be mobilized at the political level um, with specific events and tactics. This helps to uh, explain why some conflicts are intractable and why stable peace is challenged in many settings, but it also explains why some religious groups, for instance, live peacefully in certain parts of the world, but in other parts of the world, uh, they are in continuous um, conflict. So moving from conflict to peace, uh, of course, Galton's theory is important in describing peace, identified negative peace, defining it as the absence of violence or the fear of violence, and then positive peace, which is what we are looking for when we're talking about peace or tourism, which is the attitudes, institutions, structures that create a sustainable, peaceful society. So the absence of war doesn't necessarily indicate sustainable form of peace. There are various dimensions of peace that have been recognized over the years. Um, by pertinent studies, I have tried to um, include certain here in this diagram. So low levels of corruption, um, good relations with neighbors, for instance, equitable distribution of resources, and so on. So how do we move from conflict to peace and what role does tourism bring into this? Um, very simply put, there are three approaches to conflict resolution. So for uh, the, the aim of peace is to, in a way, um, resolve the conflict. So there's conflict settlement at the first instance, but this is not necessarily the preferred route uh, to peace because conflict can re-emerge at this uh, point. There is conflict resolution, but at the end of the day, conflict are rarely resolved by political diplomatic means. And there is um, what we are looking for when we want a positive form of peace, which is conflict transformation. Now, conflict transformation is not necessarily the same as reconciliation, because conflict transformation requires a change in perceptions, in the attitudes of people. Um, so it lives on forgiveness, but reconciliation is more demanding than forgiveness because it asks for collective action. Um, so it's more multifaceted and complicated than just forgiving one another. Uh, reconciliation is a moral process where responsibility by specific groups needs to be accepted. Intergroup forgiveness is required. Appropriation of the others, the, the enemy's history, is important in establishing, transforming the social environment and establishing a more sustainable form of peace. So it requires a readjustment at the economic level, social level, and psychological level. So um, going back to the role of tourism into all of this, we said that tourism uh, leads to traveling, people visit opposing groups or hostile groups. So because of this interaction, the assumption is that people understand each other better, that people um, build, improve their human relations and so on. However, looking at the peace through tourism studies, what we see is that there are certain inconsistencies in terms of findings. There are studies that indicate that tourism can lead to peace building and reconciliation, so we have positive findings. And then there are studies that yield negative findings. So there is an inconsistency there as to why some studies report positive effects of peace through tourism and others not. So what we need to uh, remember in order to evaluate the peace to tourism tenet is that there are certain um, characteristics that tourism has, and we need to remember this. First, tourism can be used as a political tool. It can lead to the marginalization of groups from decision-making. So when we try to bring two hostile groups together, uh, we need to remember that there is, if, if we don't do things properly, in other words, there is a risk that groups can be marginalized, minorities can be marginalized. Tourism can also become an economic tool. So it could, if not managed properly, lead to economic competition over resources. 
it can also potentially deepen the gap between hostile groups because tourism is pretty much based on heritage interpretation. So how museums, for instance, the narrative presented in museums and cultural sites is also important for peace or tourism. So uh, for peace to contribute, for tourism to contribute to peace, it needs to eliminate certain inequalities at the political level, uh, economic and social level. At the end of the day, what we also need to remember is that um, mass tourism specifically is, has a commercial orientation. So um, when tourists travel, when mass tourists travel, they tend to travel in a tourist bubble and they tend to often have minimal contact with the host community. So this brings the question as to what forms of tourism can more effectively contribute to peace. However, there is some hopeful evidence from the studies reporting positive um, findings uh, of the role of tourism to peace. And this is that we need to have some preconditions. First of all, um, intimate contact, not passive contact, but active intimate contact between divided communities and voluntary contact. The communities that are hostile need to have some common goal, some common language, and an equal status, particularly within the tourism uh, context. So there would need to be an equal status between host and visitors. And of course, very important, government support. Um, when there has been government support in reconciliation programs and uh, peace or tourism projects, then, um, of course, there is a much more fruitful landscape and background to transform perceptions and attitudes by using education, media, not just tourism. So one uh, complements the other. And what we also see is that specific tourism forms such as ecotourism or community-based tourism can actually be more efficient and more effective in eliminating these inequalities that exist between divided communities and offer leads to conflict or conflict re-emergence. So I have tried to, uh, in my paper, have tried to summarize these various factors as a reminder of, of how we should evaluate, in my opinion, peace tourism. We need to remember the, the causes of conflict. So when we study conflict in a specific setting, what caused the conflict in the first place? In the first place, what is the background of the conflict? In other words, um, how long did the conflict last? The longer, the worse, the more difficult it is to change perceptions. What stage conflict are we talking about? How big is the ethnic or cultural gap between hostile groups? Um, we need to consider things like the role of tour guides and the narrative that we uh, present in specific museums and cultural sites. Uh, whether there is political support for uh, reconciliation and so on. And we also need to remember that tourism, mass tourism is global. It is um, based on, you know, it's an industry. So it is based on an organized mode. Uh, maybe mass tourism alone may not be efficient enough in bringing reconciliation, but specific group, uh, forms of tourism can. And this is because in um, small scale, more uh, community-based tourism forms, there is a more active form of contact, which is of essence, when we talk about peace through tourism. And last, of course, we need to remember that there are various uh, facets that tourism needs to contribute to, economic, social, political being uh, the three important ones, but also there are various sectors Tana? Yes. Okay, we lost you for a second. Okay. I Can think you're you are back. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so as a concluding slide, uh, I think we, we cannot talk of the peace or tourism uh, tenant without referring to what has been the great pandemic of, of um, our uh, century, which is uh, COVID, uh, still ongoing, unfortunately. It has disrupted global tourism. It brought international travel uh, at a standstill. Um, so it's a very good opportunity, I think, now to reconceptualize, in a way, uh, the peace to tourism tenant in the post-COVID-19 era. 
Um, what is interesting is that there are recent papers that have emerged suggesting that um, despite the negative effects of, of the pandemic, there is an opportunity for sustainability uh, and sustainable development to actually work because international travel has been brought to a standstill. Um, suggestions have been put forth by various colleagues that suggest that there is um, a hidden opportunity to think, behave and operate more sustainably in the post-COVID-19 era. And of course, we need to place within this context the peace through tourism uh, tenet. Um, so in the post-COVID-19 era, questions that we need to consider is what type of sustainable tourism forms can we um, emphasize in terms of development, tourism development that can contribute to peace uh, and the improvement of relations between groups. Um, probably a more localized tourism development approach and strategy needs to be utilized and since this opportunity has been given to us that will of course consider the requirements of sustainable peace through tourism. And all of this, of course, depends on meaningful contact. So the word meaningful and active contact, I think, are important components um, for the peace through tourism efforts. And I believe my colleagues that will uh, follow this presentation will talk about specific examples, will talk more critically um, about this presenting interesting um, examples as to how the peace through tourism uh, that can be more effectively utilized. So thank you. That's all for me from my side. Thank you very much, Dr. Anna, for this insightful presentation, for setting the scene uh, with uh, here's a theoretical background of this question um, and this relation basically between uh, tourism and peace. Very insightful uh, presentation. I guess that many questions um, might arise here uh, from the participants. Please take note of the questions that you may have. Uh, take already a step actually to Slido, uh, so we can uh, already actually start compiling the questions uh, for the Q&A, which will be held uh, at the end of the three presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now uh, move to our next presentation. Uh, so this uh, presentation will be from uh, Dr. Fabio Carboni, sorry. Uh, his academic research and teaching, teaching activities mainly um, uh, relate here to the question of the complex relations between cultural heritage management and uh, tourism. And more specifically uh, on the question of promotion of inter intercultural dialogue, global understanding and peace. He's currently a lecturer of the International Tourism Management at uh, Coventry University in UK, uh, where he is also collaborating uh, with the Center for Trust, Peace and Social uh, Relations uh, as an associate member. His contribution is grounded on the multi and transdisciplinary academic training uh, he has actually uh, received uh, with a background uh, initially in humanities, archaeology, uh, progressing then uh, to tourism for master and PhD, uh, but also completed with diplomas in international relations and cultural diplomacy, religion, conflict and peace, uh, the question also of uh, human humanitarian sorry, response uh, to conflict and disaster, as well as environmental security and uh, sustaining peace. So beyond his academic career, he has a long experience as a consultant in the field of cultural heritage management and sustainable tourism uh, development. Uh, he has also uh, dedicated uh, to a series of pro bono activities in the field of uh, tourism and peace. Uh, and I guess that uh, this will serve uh, as a basis uh, for the cases that we will go through together. Uh, so this actually a combination of academic uh, as well as uh, here volunteer uh, experience. Uh, so Dr. Fabio, uh, the floor is yours. 25 minutes if we can uh, maintain within uh, this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And uh, congratulations for the organization of this summer school. Uh, I would like to say hello and thanks a lot to the organizing committee uh, hello to the colleagues, uh, Anna and uh, Omar, 
uh, really is an honor to share the the table with the, with, uh, with you both because I'm I'm your fan. And uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have this uh, this task today of uh, showing here something more practical. And you know, optimism always has a dark side. That is, uh, when you go on the ground in the reality, things uh, can look a little bit worse than. Uh, uh, what we imagine in inside the the, the, the walls of the the, the, the university. Uh, I'm going to share my my screen and start with <clears throat> with my presentation. Yeah, this is why my uh, the title of my presentation uh, has uh, um, this question mark. Uh, I really it's, it's it's challenging. I'm I normally very provocative in my. In my in my presentation, exactly because I like to share uh, another point of view. Um, Dr. Farmaki uh, already introduced some of the uh, some of the ideas that can be contradictory when we talk about uh, tourism and peace, and I'm going uh, to uh, more more in depth and uh, showing um, some uh, something from the uh, from the reality of uh, tourism uh, nowadays. Um, a, a brief introduction. When we talk about the, um, the SDG, we, um, how we measure them, how we, uh, from the quantitative and the qualitative point of view. Well, um, we have this, we call this five Ps, no? people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. So we immediately see that uh, uh, the peace is one of the main, um, um, element of the all structure of the SDG that reflect the the the, um, the idea of the original idea of, uh, of of sustainability and in fact the United Nations they told us that the, um, there is no sustainable development without peace and at the same time there is no peace without sustainable development uh, and this is mm, a, a, an introduction. Uh, to, um, to the importance of uh, in the structure of the SDG, you know, that is the, the topic of the, of the summer school, the importance of this um, goal 16 uh, related to, uh, to peace. But peace is, uh, uh, is something that is more complex than what we, uh, what we think. Uh, the idea itself of peace uh, if we go from the philosophical point of view, we will understand that the um, peace itself uh, is not um, unanimously uh, something good uh, in the uh, global development. We can go back to, to Kant, for example, and Kant say, like United Nations say, if there is no peace, basically uh, there is no development for the, uh, for the world for the world the Kant used to say the the war is the greatest obstacle but on the other side and more or less in the same uh, in the same period Hegel say exactly the contrary if there is no war there will be no development because the war uh, naturally define who is the 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 the, 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 the culture the population that has to lead the process of development so you can see and and obviously when we think about the philosophy, we don't we don't have to think about okay. This is something that is, it belongs to the past. No, um, this is something that uh, Kant, Hegel, etc. They belong to the past, but based on this, uh, we define our current philosophies. For example, we can say that the mm, my personal philosophy, uh, my personal approach is more Kantian. The United Nations fall of more the, 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 the idea of Kant. But for example, what about the um, uh, international politics of, uh, of the, United, uh, in the, the United States? Well, we can say that it's already something in the middle, probably even more related to what Hegel said than uh, what Kant said. Everything, all the um, imperialistic, in culture and countries, they follow more, even if not explicitly, they follow more what we call about real politics, even in the international arena. So they follow the idea of Hegel in the reality. There is, 
if there is no war, we will not know who is the best that can lead the, the, the development. And this is just an idea just to, um, to show you that then in the reality, this idea of peace, well, there is a lot of, um, to talk about. Even in this case, for example, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, he has this kind of motto, no? uh, speak softly, so be gentle, and, uh, but carry a big stick and you will go far. Uh, well, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so this is just to, uh, to introduce you in the complexity of the idea itself of, uh, of peace. And then it's not only the complexity, but also the, uh, the, the different uh, elements that compo uh, compose uh, the, 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 the main, uh, this, this condition of peace. We go from, uh, from the idea of uh, freedom, human rights, uh, it's, it's so, as Anna also was saying, it's not only about war. Uh, if we think about, for example, slavery, uh, it's something that, despite the fact that in Europe, from the um, basically the, the 10th century, uh, is uh, the slavery is abolished, and uh, in the United States, with the 13th Amendment, uh, the slavery is, ab is abolished. We know that in the reality, and here is my, <laughs> my, 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 my goal here is bring the reality. In the reality, slavery still exists. And it's not something that is uh, um, not something that we only uh, can perceive watching the news in the television, reading the newspapers, etc. But there is a study about this. I want to bring you here what is the, the for example, the data of the Global Slavery Index uh, about Italy, my country. Uh, so we have here uh, a population of uh, uh, 145,000 slaves at the moment in Italy. Slaves in which sense? Forced labor, uh, forced sexual exploitation, uh, also of uh, children, okay, and forced marriage. And we are talking about today in Italy. So when we talk about peace, well, this is what we are talking about at the moment um, in terms of, uh, in terms of still without thinking about the conflict. When then we think about the conflict within a nation or between nation, well, the, the Amnesty International, for example, tell us that uh, the levels of hate and fear perceived are exactly at the same level when Hitler rose to, uh, to, to power. Uh, and once again, this is something that we experience daily in, uh, in our life. Uh, there is this, the, um, a decrease, a constant decrease actually during the last years in the global country peaceful, peacefulness uh, and continue to, this, this decrease is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is continuing. And uh, yeah, as I was saying, here we have the, the, the um, what we have when we simply we turn on the, 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 the television. So uh, politicians that tend more, as I was saying the, in the beginning, even, even if it's not explicit, particularly some state and some cultures, they are more related to the idea of Hegel of peace. That is, peace in the reality is not that good, okay? Uh, then the idea of uh, Kant. And this is, until now, I was talking mostly as an Italian, an, Euro an European. But if we go, for example, in places like, like Middle East and we think about, we think about Syria, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's clear to all of us that um, the, the situation uh, is continuing, uh, is in a continuous, um, Mm, deterioration. Okay, still now in the last days, for example, the the uh, the conflict in Syria start to be again more hard after uh, more than than 10, 11, uh, 11 years. Okay, um, so this is the context of this global order or disorder that we have today, and this is helpful for us to understand. What is the importance 
of this uh, specific uh, this specific uh, goal. Uh, there is something very important to to understand at this point. Uh, peace does not exist in nature, uh, and it's not so, something that is only that is only related to human beings. If we go outside our window and we see the nature itself is based on conflict. Uh, Dr. Fermat, Anna was, was saying in the beginning about the, the, the nature of conflict within the, 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 the humans uh, that is go back in the history since the beginning. But it's normal, it's normal because the conflict is something natural. Peace is not something natural. But as, you, as the UNESCO said, if we can imagine peace, then we can build peace. And this is where start our responsibility towards the creation of uh, uh, of uh, a culture of uh, a culture of peace. Um, so the goal um, aims to uh, achieve uh, all the condition, as we saw, is an integrated uh, an integrated um, uh, condition that we need to say. Okay, we live in a peaceful, uh, in a peaceful society that goes from the domestic violence to the so civil war, but the um, interstate war. Okay, but also the insecurity inside our uh, our societies, and and we know according to the data that the the perception of security among the people in the West is uh, uh, also deteriorating. So. Basically, what we feel is we are not secure in our houses, in our streets. Okay, so this is what is um, belong to uh, the aspect that uh, Anna was talking about about uh, the negative peace. Even us in Europe, we are in, officially we are in peace. But if we go and we define what peace is, we are actually living a negative uh, peace. Okay, uh, now. Back to the to, to the SDG. The SDG 16 uh, then has several targets. C 16 more uh, two uh, different targets. Uh, the idea is, um, in the practice, what can be useful for us? Like when we decide, okay, we want to achieve uh, or at least promote a culture of peace through tourism. And we want to embrace the SDG 16. Um, one of um, one of the things that is interesting to see, for example, is that the um, main companies, not related to tourism, uh, but main companies that decide to invest uh, to the CSR uh, or anyway they want to invest in the SDG and particularly in the SDG 16. Um, they invest in which target, um, particularly in the idea of reduction of uh, uh, corruption. So they, this is what they invest. So they decide as a company, I want to uh, embrace the SDG. I want to contribute to um, achieve to until 2030 the, the these uh, sustainable goals, and among others, the goal. 16. Within the goal 16, I think that what is important and what I can uh, operationalize in terms of company, in terms of contribution, is reduce the level of corruption. Okay. And it actually makes sense um, promote um, this, uh, this philosophy among the companies. But the problem here is what? The problem here is if you look at this, the very first target of the goal 16, that is significantly reduce all forms of violence and related death rates everywhere, is the last target considered by the companies. Okay. In tourism, it is exactly the contrary. We can invest on this first and most important, in my, uh, from my point of view, target. So the question is. Can we really invest in this? Is really uh, tourism a vehicle of peace? Um, if we go and analyze what is the 
the, the, the function of tourism according to the United Nations, the World Tourism Organization? Well, yes, because since the 1975, the, the United Nations and the, and the specialized agency, uh, World Tourism Organization, they tell us, among the other things, uh, tourism contribute to peace, as you can see, prosperity, universal respect, etc. but peace. So 1975, if we go to the literature, uh, Anna show some, uh, some literature already, here I give some step ahead, like I divide in my last article, uh, three main approach, no? Uh, tourism and peace building in the literature. So peace tourism and then tourism and peace. Uh, anyway, exists a literature about, about tourism and peace. So the answer once again is yes. Yes, can eventually be um, a vehicle for peace. Why? Because people that travel around the world, they tend to um, meet each other and uh, the, the encounter with other culture is going to create a sort of um, open-mindedness uh, that uh, lead us to a better understanding uh, and improved understanding that lead to peace, the content uh, hypothesis, okay? And in the literature, this is what we found. There is a natural link between tourism and peace. Well, uh, no, there is not a natural link between, between tourism and peace. Absolutely not. Particularly because tourism is in the practice, in the practice, and this is what I bring today, the practice, tourism is still in the chain of this neoliberalist approach to the, to the phenomenon. That is not the social phenomenon. For example, I teach tourism here in UK in the Faculty of Business and Law. Okay, business, the neoliberalist approach that we give to tourism. And here you can see in 2019, before the COVID, okay, the World Tourism Organization itself was talking about cash uh, cow. No, the tourism is the cash cow. Okay. Uh, and despite all the ideas of sustainability and peace that we promote, the reality, this is a picture obviously before COVID, uh, the reality of tourism is this. Is this a phenomenon that can really bring peace? Obviously not. On the contrary, and I was talking about, for example, the idea of the stereotypes. Well, tourism by itself, Tourism can potentially bring to peace, but tourism by itself, a study demonstrate that in some cases reinforce the stereotypes that are in the mind of the visitor. Example, I go to Italy, okay, as, a, as an American. When I go back to America, uh, I say, yes, it is really true that all the Italians shout in the streets, they just eat pasta, okay? This is the the practice of the, 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 the result, the findings of the study that say tourism actually reinforce in certain cases the stereotypes. But here I bring more example, even um, more dramatic, okay? Here we have people in holiday, while there are the arrival of uh, migrants alive or not, okay? Here we are in the coast of uh, Spain in particular, here we are in Greece, where the tourist that uh, should be the ambassador of peace, no, there is a lot of rhetoric around this, no? But in the reality, what we are looking for as a tourist, uh, the perfect selfie, the perfect experience for us, not for the others. So this idea is still not inside this, the, 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 this idea of being real ambassador of peace is not in the mind of the tourist because it's still not in the mind of those who promote and organize tourism. Mainly because, as I was saying before, this chain of the neoliberalist approach are leading to this, to this kind of uh, practice in the reality, okay? When we go out of the university, when we go out of the academic speech about sustainability, then this is the uh, reality. Oviedo, Spain, 
all of us know about the over tourism uh, phenomenon the reaction no for example imagine in the in the in, uh, in the academy we talk about the contact hypothesis uh, the local population that enter in contact with the tourists etc 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 in the reality what happened people in barcelona venice rome and many other cities they are tired of tourists. They don't want to stay with, them. Don't, they don't want to see tourists, tourists anymore, okay? So, and this is another aspect. Another tragic aspect, um, the uh, commodification, touristification, if we want, of the misery of certain uh, groups, okay? I can tell you, uh that some uh, already some years ago in india for example that the the taj mahal the famous monument uh was not anymore the main attraction of india but the main attraction in terms of visitors became the slums okay so uh the slums the, the visiting uh, all poor people, okay? What kind of peace? And, and it's very interesting, by the way, to notice who are the main visitors here. White people, normally Western people that arrive there with this idea of uh, uh, a neocolonialism, no? And, uh, and this also, and this behavior of uh, uh, the honest, uh, inspire everything but the idea of peace okay this invasion of people in the slums of india to see how poor and how really poor are the people there are we breaking stereotypes absolutely not in the reality we are not doing this the covid is going to um, make something better to the situation absolutely not that um the tendency is going to be uh, exactly the opposite the dehumanization of entire groups is going to be uh, even worse than now here is the i invite you all to go to the uh, the, the site the website of the faroe islands where they have a fantastic idea for the tourists okay the, during the COVID, okay, they put a helmet on the on the head of the lo of local peoples, and the person with the joystick can move the person no, <laughs> through the island. So from London, I can see uh, I can see the Faroe Island without any real interaction with the person. This is the terrible thing. That the, the 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 this is the 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 horror uh behind this idea from my point of view there is no no interaction with the person the person become the machine that is exactly against once again the idea of kant no that philosophically said the man should always be the um the 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 the, the, the final um well the benefit of the man should always be the final goal of every action and the man should never be the mean to other goals. In this case, the man, the person, is the mean, is a machine, basically, in the hand of this virtual tourist that is manipulating it to the joystick. Something different is, um, also, this is also during COVID, with Palestine and with the Palestine farmers, uh, we developed this, uh, this, this project, and we ask to the Palestine farmers uh, the, from the farmers from palestine please let us see not not the border with the with israel not the no let us see what you do during your day. and this yes this is the example of how potentially tourism can break stereotypes but not by nature like the most of the literature say so this was a farmer in palestine in gaza that said this is what we do we did not talk about war. Of course, there was uh, some 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 uh, some aspect of his speech when he talked about. It. But mainly, 
we knew about an activity that is not war, okay? There is um, a fantastic uh, uh, book about a novelist from Nigeria that is uh, the talk about the danger of the single story. Every time we talk about Gaza and Palestine, we, we think about war. This is a single story. But in the reality, there are people in Gaza, there are people that, they, that live there, that go to the school. And it is important also for us to have a different uh, idea of this, uh, to use tourism exactly to go beyond the, the, the single story. That is uh, dangerous. So, um, in the reality, what, what exists? Or there is an oversimplified concept of tourism as an agent of, for peace, or mm, there are, as Anna also was showing, and there is a, a, a list of negative uh, implication of, uh, of tourism. Now, I would like to, mm, to make some final considerations about the possibility of tourism really uh, become a, a, a way to uh, a way to peace. Uh, when we talk about positive peace, uh, Galtu, this uh, this author uh, that is fundamental for um, who work with the, um, peace and conflict studies, uh, one of the one of the elements of a positive peace is the mutual cultural understanding and respect. Okay, uh, and this is where the tourism should invest more, okay? Why? Also because nowadays, because of the number of information, the, the quantity of information that we have, um, we are almost, uh, for us, is the, the normal thing. The atrocities are the normal thing, which is, which is absolutely um, dangerous for the future of uh, our children and the next generation, because we cannot get uh, adapted and we cannot get used to the atrocities, but this is what actually is happening. And tourism can, uh, can provide us uh, an alternative to this approach. Uh, particularly when we talk about violence, uh, of course, tourism cannot go against the direct violence. There is, uh, as the literature say, Peace is a beneficial for tourism. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. With all the due respect, I'm an academic too, in part. So, uh, with all the due respect, what is obvious? No, I don't go in holiday in uh, right now in Syria, or I did not go in holiday in Sarajevo during the siege. Obvious, okay. Uh, but at the same time, tourism cannot do anything in front of an armed conflict. Okay, so what is the direct violence? that Galtung defined. But tourism can do a lot with regards to cultural violence. There is a form of violence that exists within a context of negative peace, okay? Uh, that is the, exactly this, uh, mm, this education to peace that we can have to tourism that go also then to uh, fix also main issues related to structural violence, okay? Uh, that is, when people are more aware about certain situations, they are more aware about the danger of single story and they want to go beyond the single story, but we should rethink tourism to do this. In that case, they are going to act also on what is the structural violence and bring structural peace, okay? Structural violence in Gatung is well, an example of structural violence is apartheid, for example, no? Uh, like it's a form of violence that is accepted by law, okay? Uh, so, yeah, very yeah, sorry. Cool. Very sorry, Dr. Fabio, to interrupt. Uh, can, can we wrap up in the interest of time? Yeah, yeah, I'm concluding here. Perfect, thanks. Okay. So uh, basically, what, according to what we, what we saw, uh, what is here the, 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 the um, perspective in practice for the future? Um, tourism should not act by itself. Should, tourism should act uh, in a, within a cultural system, an educational strategy that is favorable uh, to, uh, to peace. Um, so straightening the relationship between tourism and culture, okay? 
review the structure of tourism offer and the idea of tourism experience itself. Okay. And finally, the, uh, the idea of education in tourism. Uh, mm, at the moment, I'm writing two articles. One is going to be published soon and is exactly about education in tourism. Why we don't teach tourism and peace in our courses, for example? Okay, so this is the, the main idea. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope there will be a lot of uh, questions and a very good debate. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Fabio. And once again, sorry for the interruption. I hope that we, we can continue uh, with uh, the interactive uh, Q&A uh, as we conclude uh, these three presentations. Um, so do not hesitate, participants, to go to Slido and uh, post your questions uh, to Dr. Fabio uh, from now on. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Omar Moufakir. Uh, Omar Moufakir. Here is currently the head of the Department of Business Administration uh, at the Bloomfield University for Science and Technology in Kuwait. He has 20 years of teaching and management experience in the USA, the Netherlands, France, and Kuwait. Dr. Omar's uh, research interest spans from uh, marketing and management applied to service, hospitality, tourism, leisure, events, and sustainable community development. Today, he will uh, conclude the house session uh, with some critical thoughts uh, here about this relation between tourism and peace. Dr. Omar, the floor is yours. Dr. Omar, we cannot hear you for now. I think you may need to unmute yourself. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you for having us all here. Thank you to my colleagues, to the um, organizers of this uh, important event and those who are with us today. Um, my presentation, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy uh, to hear our, my colleagues what they have presented. So what I can start with is when we talk about tourism and peace uh, to our viewers, don't be uh, shocked uh, because you will hear us, we academics, we are, um, we talk about tourism and peace and we can be shy. We talk about tourism and peace and we can be angry. We talk about tourism and peace and we can be shocked. We talk about tourism and peace and we can be excited. And all this because this is what tourism and peace is about. It is and it is not. So my presentation is more about um, um, to give it a critical outlook and hopefully it will add to my colleagues' presentations. So I'm going to share my presentation with you or are you going to do it from your side, Elise, or do I have to do it from my side? I believe it's on your side, if uh, okay. you, you're able to share. Sure. Thank you. All right. There we go. I'm not going to dwell more on what my colleagues has, have already uh, said, tourism contributes to development and poverty reduction. If you look at what UN WTO uh, they they say is that the focus is more on developing countries that they have valuable tourism resources, and the tourism activity has a strong potential of geographical expansion, including in remote areas. Uh, the tourism supply chain has a high capacity to support and complement other economic activities, such as traditional agriculture in these countries, in this part of the world, transport, handicrafts. Tourism is a labor intensive sector, creating many opportunities for youth and women. Tourism is a sector where entry barriers for SMEs can be quite low and that contribute to the development in poor areas. This, this, this could be in, in some ways and in part of the world, yes, but when you talk about tourism that contributes to 
uh, poverty eradication or alleviation, go and see how many people go to Africa. And go and see how many people go to 10 top destinations in Africa and how about the other, the other uh, uh, places in Africa besides uh, the capitals or the heritage. Well, we all have exclamation marks about this. I love this picture. This tells me a lot about tourism. It tells me a lot about peace. The other side, you know, I can be excited and I can be happy and I can be sad and I can be, you can make of this picture whatever you want to make of it. But this is to me, it's an example of tourism and peace. Whether some are visiting and trying to, uh, uh, to change the culture of the others or bringing money to them and changing so how do we do you do we weigh culture and and money? This is this is a big issue. Now, interestingly, all my colleagues they talked about negative peace and positive peace. I developed this uh, triangle in 2010, and still it hasn't been picked up by uh, by colleagues because actually what I'm talking about is participatory peace, and this is this is what we need. We don't need uh, peace as you defined it, positive and negative, but participatory peace, I define it as a situation in which ordinary people as world citizens, they work together for global benefit and all the global benefits that have been discussed uh, uh, already. So my concentration, I'll focus more on when we talk about tourism, we can define uh, to a certain extent, um, tourism, but it's very diff difficult to define peace. So we need to keep in mind this participatory peace. What does it make of us as citizens when we go to visit an, uh, an, a country or those people, they come and visit us? Like we talk about participatory democracy, democracy is not about one vote, one person and one vote, but it's citizenship participation. So for peace, it's that peace participation for peace. And this is why I have this, uh, this triangle. And I hope that you'll find it uh, interesting and we can talk about it any other time. Peace is reference for life. Peace is the most precious possession of humanity. Peace is more than the end of armed conflict is more than the end of armed conflict. Peace is a mode of behavior. Peace is a deep rooted commitment to the principles of liberty, justice, equality, and solidarity among all human beings. Peace is also a harmonious partnership of humankind with the environment. Today, on the eve of the 21st century, peace is within our reach. Now, with peace, the way that I, 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 I see peace and I find this very, very uh, uh, interesting, we should think about if there is to peace, if there is to peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Peace, the world evokes the simplest and most cherished dream of humanity. Peace is and has always been the ultimate human aspiration. And yet our history overwhelmingly shows that while we speak incessantly of peace, our actions tell a different story. And we can go more. There is no such thing as peace through, through tourism, per se, or tourism for peace. Undoubtedly, tourism can be a vehicle for peace, but education for peace starts at home. I cannot be a tourist, a good tourist here and 
a bad person there or a bad person here, and then I turn out to be a good tourist. A concept that I find very revealing is when we talk about peacelessness. Our peacelessness is the result of inequality in the world. This inequality is a result of ignorance, greed, and failed policies. Thinking about peacelessness is what takes us further away from the animal kingdom as human beings, accepting that peacelessness is what brings us closer to animals. Surely there is, you know, I'm not giving justice to the animals, but surely there is the animal and the human, but which of these is close, closer to humanity remains to be explained in our actions as individuals, as people, and as tourists. Peace is not the product of victory or a command. It has no finishing line, no final deadline, no fixed definition of achievement. Peace is a never ending story, the work of many decisions. This is why when we talk about tourism and we try to find tourism in peace and for peace, it's a never ending story because there is always something new, something new happening to the world. What is it? How, how are we going to do to contribute to the elevation of that peacelessness in, 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 in the world, in our countries and neighboring countries? Our peacelessness is multifaceted. It's rather sociocultural. But then again, put in and the economic side and so. But sociocultural because we are human beings and the economic side of underdeveloped and uh, developing and so shouldn't shouldn't exist. We should all be developed, economically developed, one way or the or the other. If we were all thinking about our human brothers and sisters, our humanity. We are fighting against poverty. We are fighting against terror. We are fighting against environmental disasters. We are fighting against racism. We are fighting against orthodoxy, fundamentalism. We are fighting against alienation. We are fighting against discrimination. We are fighting against prejudice. We are fighting against ignorance, bigotry, and hatred. And if we talk about tourism and peace, how can we use tourism to fight this multifaceted nature of peacelessness? Then we can talk about tourism and peace. Then we can talk about the tenets of tourism and peace. Uh, my colleague Fabio, he already says, you know, this quote, since war, begins in the minds of men. It is in the minds of men that defenses of peace must be constructed. Not that I go to that destination or I go to the other destination or I go. So we need to teach for peace and not just about peace. Surely, as Fabio said, why? Why would I have, we don't have a, a course about tourism and peace education through for peace through tourism. We don't have that. And if you, pro you propose it, people, they might even have smirks and might laugh for it because it's business. Or when you talk about peace and tourism, they think that, you know, we're going to hold hands and sing hallelujah. No, we are doing, we are academics and we are looking at peace from all its facets and trying to find ways to contribute to the business of tourism. So the business of tourism is not about money. But there is more to tourism than money. There is human understanding, relations that we need to nurture and promote also. And this is why in 2010, I came up with this circle of peacelessness and peace through tourism. If you want to study and talk about peace and tourism, we need to talk about democracy, conflict, prejudice, global warming, inequality in the world, 
integration. And we have, when we talk about conflict, we talk about tourism of reconciliation. We talk about the peace parks, the peace places, whether it's positive that or not, that's another discussion. Pre prejudice, we write about cross-cultural understanding and quality encounters in tourism. Global warming, we talk about and we write about sustainable tourism development and tourism ethics. Inequality, we write about tourism education and education for peace. And hopefully, uh, uh, if Fab Fabio would like to be our lead on this, then we really should do something about it to bring it to, to the academic uh, arena and in the classroom. We talk about integration. We talk about social tourism. This is good. We talk about domestic tourism, heritage tourism, cultural tourism, poverty. We write about uh, pro poor tourism, volunteer tourism, philanthropic tourism, community based tourism. But all these, they have. It's just like if I tell you and I tell my, uh, my students, you can tell me anything about tourism. It's like you flip a coin. If it's tail, it's head. Tourism is like fire. It can cook your food, but it can burn your house. And this is what tourism is, is, is actually, if we don't pay attention to the peacelessness that we can get from tourism. There is more to tourism than economics. There is more to peace than money. As there are different faces of conflict, peace is also multi-faceted. Peace is too important to leave it to politi politicians alone. Tourism is too important to leave it to the industry alone. Hence, education for peace precludes peace through tourism. Tourists, not tourism, can contribute to peace. It is tourists that can contribute to peace, not tourism. We can, can go with the crazy tourism uh, development. And well, and where are the tourists and who are the tourists? Uh, I go from a believer to an agnostic and it hurts me so much. When I started, you know, in 28, Oh, tourism and peace, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, I'm, 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 I'm losing it a little bit. There is no comprehensive empirical study that shows the relationship. I checked tourism management annals of tourism and all the, there is a lack of quantitative research that can tell me that tourism contributes to peace in this way or the other because there are complex models with a too parsim parsimonious parsimony. I'm being sarcastic here. How many variables are you going to put in that model to show that that case contribute to, that tourism contribute to peace? We have case studies. We don't have longitudinal studies, both tourism and peace. Uh, we used to have, now we have a few uh, academics that they started to use quantitative methodologies. But I, I review for, uh, for journals and ranked uh, journal and so, and when I see tourism and peace, I just look at it and it's a lot of blah, blah. It's already been said. Give me something, give me something that makes me happy again. So we need, we need more quantitative analysis and we need more sophisticated uh, models. Less, you know, more parsimonious than less. No longitudinal studies. Even those that are good, their sample size is small. Their sample size are non-representative. Non we don't even know about who are their, uh, the, 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 their respondents and so. There are too many assumptions and ifs when you read the tourism and peace uh, uh, paper. Assumptions, if we add this, if we take this variable, if we add this variable and 
This is what we call the black, black box of quantitative research. And then we go to the definition of peace, like what I, what I, what I, uh, uh, I shared with you uh, earlier. Then we talk about the type of tourism development. Then we talk about why mainly developing countries. When we talk about tourism and peace, we talk about developing countries and we see them as poor. They're not poor, they are economically disadvantaged, but not poor countries. All these peace parks and peace tra la la, no. Where are they? Mostly they are in, in, in uh, developing countries. Why is it so? What, what effect have they brought to uh, the local uh, community? And I don't want to go more in details through this because if I talk more about it, I might be crying. <laughs> well, because I, I, I saw, I saw some, some NGOs taking advantage of poor, very poor African countries and taking that money for tourism for peace and that money could be used to build a school or contribute to a, a hospital. So I'm not going into that. And we need to talk about also to uh, put in the equation, the indigenous population versus tourism development. Uh, a lot have been uh, done about this. I found this very interesting, this model uh, by Edgar and colleagues and in Jala Yer Khaliz Zadeh in 2018, page 33. Uh, it goes tourism, it contributes to political stability, safety and security, uh, no peace contribute to. So which means that when you see it and it goes, it's, it's a cycle, a cyclic, but tourism benefits from peace more than peace benefits from tourism. This is my opinion. I have a few examples here and, uh, but uh, uh, Fabio already talked about it. Uh, briefly, uh, when you go to a community, some people, they went with a lighter stereotype and they came back with uh, strong negative stereotypes and uh, some people, they visited destination and they had positive stereotypes and they came with negative and those negative, they came with positive and so. But there is no inconclusive conclusive results. Basically, yesterday, the question was whether tourism is good or bad, whether it is a generator of peace or simply the beneficiary of peace. I think we should go beyond this. And today the question is, how can we use tourism and the, the multifaceted nature of tourism and types of tourism to benefit the multifaceted nature of peace? And that was my last slide. Thank you very much. And uh, we're here for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Omar, for opening the floor to, to the question. Uh, definitely here, uh, this is actually uh, our time to, to interact now after hearing from the three of you. Uh, I think like uh, we have already uh, collected quite a few questions through Slido. Unfortunately, I think like uh, in the interest of time, we might not uh, be able to go through all the questions. So hence actually uh, we have asked uh, participants to vote uh, for the questions. Uh, so we are able to uh, target uh, the uh, most actually uh, popular one. Maybe as I think um, these uh, three presentations really like uh, some actually uh, possibilities for us to really like uh, go into actually very mind-provoking kind of consideration. And maybe I would like to open uh, this actually Q&A uh, with uh, one question, which could be like uh, pushing us a little bit further. Uh, so uh, here for the three speakers, uh, what is the ultimate uh, aim or goal of tourism for peace? What, what is the question again? Sorry, uh, Elise. Yes, sure. 
so the question is, what is the ultimate aim or goal of tourism for peace? Is it really peace? Who is willing to jump in the pool first? Fabio, maybe Fabio, I... Fabio, Fabio. <laughs> But no, I don't know. I probably Anna want to. I, I, I see. I, I, I see tourism as a as a as a phenomenon that is um, quite broad, and uh, only a very limited part of it was used so far for the benefit of the human beings. This is what I think. We can do a lot. We should change the approach to tourism development, tourism planning. Uh, tourism education, as, as we were saying, and uh, and see and see tourism in in a way which is different. In the beginning of the COVID, all of us, I think Anna also, Omar, we 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 we, we were very optimistic about what a prolonged lockdown could, uh, which kind of opportunity could could give uh, to us, and we all we were very optimistic about the fact that oh, when we are going out again, we are going to be better person, uh, more altruistic, etc, etc, etc. Reality is not like this. So eventually we, uh, we probably we lose one more uh, opportunity to work for, uh, for good. So uh, I think it's like Omar was saying, it's, it's a lot is about education, but education in tourism. We have to we have to train the future managers uh, to think more about this kind of things, this kind of uh, aspect and implication of the human mobility. That's it. Well, if I might say some, add something, please. <sighs> yes. Well, um, I I I think I think that look. When you see uh, uh, in 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 the world and in 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 many countries, we don't even teach tourism. Tourism is it's in business schools, and uh, I'm 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 a tourism uh, professor. I'm teaching marketing. There are no departments of uh, why because it's not taken ser seriously, which from my perspective, I think that any class. Even in technology, we should we should have peace and tourism in it. In medicine, we should have something about peace and tourism in it. Why? Because tourism actually it brings people together. And if it brings people together, we can teach how to respect each other. And that's unfortunately it's uh, it's it's missing. And I would be, I would be in uh, in pharmaceuticals or in, uh, and I'll I'll incorporate. Bring me, you know, I'm uh, the president of a university. I'll do it. I incorporate peace and tourism everywhere in all the uh, the the curricula because it's so much important. Like what I said, it brings people together. It's part of business and it's part of humanity visiting each other. If I may also add something, um, I think it's quite interesting how we talk about peace being taught in our the tourism curriculum. But I also think it's important that the potential of tourism as a peace building tool should be taught in political science, international relations disciplines, because if you talk to a graduate or a student from those kind of uh, faculties, and tell them tourism can bring peace, they will probably laugh. Mm -hmm. What um, I noticed when I read political science um, literature on peace, there is a tendency to look at the past. You know, we examine past conflicts, past situations. Why can't we see tourism as a potential futuristic, you know, um, route, tool? Uh, agents um, that can potentially lead to peace. So um, there is a lot that needs to be done to change the view that 
practitioners, policymakers, and people have of the potential of tourism, of the uh, role of tourism and the nature of tourism. And um, of course, then, uh, you know, at the next instance, we need to start uh, teaching a more expanded view of tourism to tourism students that will include um, peace. So I would agree with my colleagues that education is very important. And to answer the, the question of what is the ultimate aim, I think, uh, you know, it's not so much the aim, but it's, you know, also the process and transforming economic systems and uh, political structures and uh, perceptions and attitudes. I think that is a very important key. And education is the starting point. Thank you for the three uh, answers here, yeah, complementary one. Uh, since we are, we, we are speaking about actually embedding this in the curriculum uh, in different uh, uh, here uh, areas, uh, maybe uh, one last question really because, uh, because of the interest of time uh, is really going back actually to a very actually practical kind of questions when it comes actually to empirical studies. Uh, and um, maybe it could be a, a good way actually to, to conclude. We have uh, quite, a, quite a few students, I guess, around. Uh, so the question is, uh, can you suggest an insightful way to measure peace in tourism uh, from the empirical standpoint? It's a tricky one at the same time. <laughs> well, if, if I may I've started uh, just, just this morning, I reviewed two papers and they are very uh, revealing papers and they use uh, some models. Uh, I, can, I can share them with you later on if, if, if you want. Uh, the, we, we can, empirically we can. It's just that we need to know um, what variables are important to be included in the model. And for this, this is very, very, I, I got it as an epiphany. It came to me when I was reviewing just this morning. From an academic perspective, um, I, 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 I might say that um, many of us, they are not quantitative. You know, we, are, we, are, we are not mathematicians and we are not uh, statisticians and we are not. We need to work together with those who can do sophisticated modeling and so. We can contribute to their model because sometimes I look at a model and I say, and I'm telling to myself, that variable shouldn't be there. Why? Simply because the person, the author is not a tourism specialist. And the other way around, when I want to do something and I want to work on some uh, sophisticated models that has heavier weight, I can do it alone. So I need to, it's multidisciplinary, to go and find a colleague in the other department uh, in a, a micro, uh, what is it, economics department on modeling and so, and we can come up and work together. If we do it just separately, there is always going to be a gap there. I think. Uh, the question is yes, of the disciplines, organization of the knowledge. I see that uh, uh, Dr. Fabio, you were nodding the head. Would you like to, to follow? No, up on no, this? no. When, when we talk about uh, measuring uh, as, a, as a qualitative researcher, I mean, uh, I can have, obviously, I agree with, uh, with Omar. We need a uh, we need to find criteria of uh, measurement. Uh, we need to find the variables. What I was thinking about is um, we need, once again, first of all, as universities, uh, we need to be open to people who are researcher in tourism, which continue to study tourism alone, are not going to find any effective and realistic way to measure the effect of uh, tourism on peace. Why? Because uh, there should be there should be an integration. Uh, first of all, with cultural studies and peace and conflict studies, because we cannot know everything uh, about everything. 
So um, even for us, it's difficult to work with, uh, with, uh, with peace because uh, we need to understand what peace really means. And, and the idea, when uh, Anna showed uh, the beginning of this debate, no, uh, I think that the beginning of this debate was a bit naive. Now we are starting to talk seriously about tourism and peace. But the beginning of the debate was a bit naive, was a bit romantic, like an idea of peace, like <laughs> as Omar was saying, flowers and dancing all together in the world. And it's not absolutely, this is not what, uh, what is in the reality. So the integration of difficult areas, uh, starting from the, from the university. Thank you, Dr. Fabio. Dr. Anna, I guess that uh, with the review of uh, the different actual levels uh, here of conflict uh, and uh, possibly con conflict transformation that you have been going through, you might have some insights. Um, yes, I would like to add regarding this discussion that um, I think it's also important to realize that one size cannot fit all. So we also need to consider in any kind of research the specifics of a conflict setting. Um, so this is something that needs to be considered by researchers when they examine this contribution of tourism to peace or even setting specific goals uh, for peace through tourism. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this uh, concluding uh, statement here. Um, I think we will uh, unfortunately not have time to take any more questions, uh, but I know that uh, uh, my colleagues will uh, uh, propose uh, to all of you some uh, ways to continue the engagement beyond uh, this session uh, through social media. Uh, so uh, I will uh, uh, end here as a Q&A, just to take uh, really like one minute uh, here to highlight actually some contributions of this uh, uh, session uh, in first actually looking into uh, this uh, complex relation between tourism and peace, of course, by opening uh, first the question of, okay, what do we define as peace? Uh, we see that uh, it's not that straightforward, uh, the different forms of uh, peace, the different types of tourism, uh, and how actually uh, the analysis of the possible, the, post, uh, the potential uh, possibilities of uh, tourism contributing uh, to peace or tourism beneficiating uh, from peace, uh, really like relying sorry, on the examination of these different types and forms of um, peace and tourism. Uh, as we were going through. Uh, how Q&A, I guess that uh, all of you have also uh, seen actually this uh, uh, pool that you have been uh, contributing to. May I know if there are any, any kind of reactions from uh, our speakers here uh, regarding the pool uh, answers that you, you might have seen as we were uh, here uh, debating the questions. If that's not the case, maybe uh, we will then proceed uh, to uh, really like the uh, conclusion sorry, of. Sorry, Dr. Yes. I think the result is already shared. Maybe you I can quickly. So, yes. Yeah, can you quickly read the results? Maybe of just. Uh, okay, if we, yeah. yes, if we can take a bit of time. Perfect. Thank you for allowing us to, to take a bit more time. Uh, so uh, the first. Uh, the first question, uh, the piece uh, tourism tenet has been criticized because of, uh, so here, uh, most of us uh, <coughs> would have actually uh, replied all the above, so meaning tourism uh, may enhance uh, existing in inequalities. Tourism may be used as a political and economical tool, economic tool, sorry, and tourism does not necessarily lead uh, to meaningful contact. The second one, tourism contribution to peace building uh, needs to consider, uh, and here most of you have replied conflict background. Do not hesitate to interrupt if there is any reactions. Uh, what is the relation between the association tourism peace uh, and the SDGs? Uh, so here, most of you guys have uh, replied many possible relation in particular uh, with SDG uh, 16. Is tourism a vehicle of, of peace? Uh, here, uh, quite actually, 
contract status answers, but uh, we see that uh, most of you uh, will say that the precondition uh, for this uh, to happen are the key. And I think that uh, here we have actually partly enlightened uh, the, these actually uh, conditions. This can be defined as, and uh, here most of you would have actually said all the all the all of the above, so positive piece, negative piece, and participatory piece. Which question is more appropriate uh, to ask? Uh, so here. Uh, most of you have replied, how can we use uh, tourism to benefit the multifaced nature of peace? Education for good tourism starts, uh, and here for uh, most of you, it will be at the tourism site, in the tourism promotion, and at home, all uh, combined. So that's a little bit about the pool results. We have any reactions here? Since we have a little bit, we, we have been uh, allowed actually a bit of uh, uh, additional time. All right. So in this case, I think we'll uh, proceed to uh, hear the next uh, session. Uh, I mean, the sec next actually a part of the conclusion of uh, our session. You are invited to share your feedbacks, your thoughts uh, in the word cloud uh, using Slido. So you have already the uh, Slido uh, QR code. If it's not the case, don't hesitate uh, to scan again here. Uh, so this is for you to provide uh, some of your feedback, uh, how actually this session has been provoking your thoughts. Uh, and I think here uh, we had really like some opportunities many opportunities actually to uh, get actually uh, to uh, rethink uh, this relation between uh, tourism and peace. As you are keying maybe your inputs in Slido, uh, maybe we can proceed uh, here finally uh, to a session, digital photo session. Uh, my colleague, Ms. Keira, who was behind the screen. Thank you very much, Ms. Keira, for assisting us, facility, facilitating uh, the compilation of the different questions. So Ms. Keira will be taking a picture. So all of us are invited to uh, switch on our camera uh, so we can actually uh, here capture uh, our participation to this session. All right, ready? Ms. Keira. Yeah, so we are now in page one. So say cheese. Right, uh, page two. Page three. Okay, page five, page four, page four, All right, few more, okay, so I guess this is the last one, but since participant is not open the uh, camera, yeah, that's all, back to you, Dr. Ines. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you everyone uh, for uh, this uh, exciting session. Uh, we will now proceed uh, to the, uh, the closing remarks, I believe, uh, with uh, Dr. Canapan and Dr. Chantini. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Elise, for moderating the session well and good. Uh, with the three speakers, especially this session is the one with three speakers. And thanks to Ms. Kyria for monitoring the Slido as well as filtering the questions and passing to Dr. Ellis and also acknowledging our memory with the photographs. And uh, on behalf of CRIT, Taylor's University Malaysia, we would like to thank all the three speakers, Dr. Enna, Dr. Fabio and Dr. Omer for a very wonderful, probably electrifying sharing session to end our 
summer school with a word of peace and look for more collaborations, networking and uh, showing the value of the human. I think the pandemic has shown us. Uh, just I am popping up the word cloud, the feedback for this session for the speakers. Uh, I think the bigger bubbles we are getting is the peace. Uh, participants who have not done the word cloud, please scan on the QR code on the left top bottom, sorry on the top left. So it won't take much time, just post in single word the feedback of this session. And don't close the slido, we also will be requesting in a short while for another feedback. So let's see whether we hit at least 100.